incredible amount of respect for, uh, who probably know more people with developmental disabilities in this community than anybody in this room. Um, Sheila Ross uh, graduated in 1992 with a master's in counseling psychology. Uh, Sheila has been in private practice in the past. She's worked with planned lifetime networks in the past. She's worked frontline in a group home. She's worked as a manager in a group home. And uh, since 1994, she has worked with the community support team uh, and has provided counseling support to people uh, with developmental disabilities as well as some people with additional mental health issues. Susan Weber started, Susan, I'm making you sound older here, sorry. Uh, Su Susan started back in 1972, and I think it's interesting that she started with the Community Living Society uh, that was started out by the Woodlands, per uh, the Woodlands Parent Group. Uh, Susan uh, has uh, her first degree in child and youth care, and she worked with Perks Clinic in the early intervention program. And so Susan is now in the position where she is providing support, counseling support to people that she knew as preschoolers. Uh, I think that it gives an interesting perspective. Uh, Susan graduated with a master's in educational psychology in 19, 19, 2000. 2000. And uh, Susan's been with the community support team since 1989, and in that period of time, she's provided a lot of counseling support as, long as, as well as done a lot of group work. So welcome, Sheila and Susan. Good morning, everybody. Um, Sheila and I are going to um, try our best to... Um, oh, wait, sorry. Uh, we'll try our best to um, give you a sense of uh, the amount of um, details that we kind of, we try to take into account when we first get a referral from somebody. Um, we get a referral for a certain issue, but very often that's not what we end up doing. And we, we uh, look at lots of different aspects of a person's life trying to um, enter into the inner life of a person and to support that person to have um, a voice of their own. Oh, I'm sorry, Sheila. I was going to do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sheila and I, well, Sheila and I were, were doing this together, and uh, we just realized this morning that um, we both... Uh, had um, thought we were doing the same slides all the way through instead of trading back and forth. <laughs> so first of all, a definition of counseling, because we all at times, or a lot of us at times, um, uh, seek out counseling support so that we are able to live our life in a more satisfying and, and happier way. And um, so it's a developmental process in which the counselor um, interacts with the client. And it's developmental in that it is, it, it is um, changing and growing as we're in that relationship with that person. <coughs> and we expect guidance and encouragement, um, <coughs> challenge and inspiration, so that we can manage and resolve practical, personal, and relationship issues. And to achieve our goals and gain self-realization. And the counseling process is the same for whomever uh, accesses that support. And that's what we provide for the people that we serve. Um, definition of developmental disability, it's a lifelong condition. People grow and develop more slowly. There's limitations in intellectual and adaptive function, so in other words, um, being able to um, adapt to their environment, um, whatever that 
that may be, there might be difficulties for them to do that. Difficulties understanding abstract concepts or meeting the demands of everyday life. Um, we need to make things as concrete as possible, black and white, because um, uh, abstract concepts are difficult for people to understand. And just the basics of, um, you know, getting up in the morning and following a routine or a schedule can be difficult for, for these folks. Uh, abilities vary greatly and may or may not be accompanied by physical conditions. And it is not the same as a mental illness, although in some cases the person may have both. Actually, in many case, we, cases, we work with people who have multiple disabilities as well as um, multiple mental health issues. And that um, these are um, not barriers to counseling. They're, they are the, the hurdles and challenges that, that people have to, and, and to, to work with and what it's helpful for a counselor in this field to be aware of um, because what what is important is a person's motivation and um, their desire to um, make changes in their lives and we've both seen quite amazing um, work that people have done to uh, understand their life and to to move on and to uh, develop a, a happier life for themselves. So uh, we get a referral and um, sometimes it's appropriate and sometimes it's not. Um, so uh, help is requested for a specific issue and the person is willing and motivated to learn new skills and make changes in life. That is the crucial component. Um, and because we always work with the whole support network around somebody, it's important that there are there is someone within that network that is willing and motivated to learn new skills and make changes. Because sometimes it takes quite a while um, and we spend time working to make a connection and a relationship with the client. Um, the person is available and able to follow through. And that they're able to establish a relationship with a new person. Sometimes that's, um, that's difficult for people to do and then we we would work more with uh, familiar people in that network. Um, when counseling is not appropriate, uh, when there's a lack of support and resources, um, something as simple as a telephone, some of our folks don't have. So just trying to get in touch with people to make appointments can be an issue. Um, and uh, if they don't have the resources to have a telephone, um, and if they don't live with a caregiver or a staff person, just trying to get in touch can be, can be difficult. Um, uh, sometimes when we get a referral, uh, the issue is not recognized as a problem for the actual client. It's more, uh, it can be more an issue for the um, the staff that work with the client or their family members, um, but the person themselves may not see it as an issue. Um, for example, uh, one of the referrals that uh, we had not too long ago, the parents thought that the person, their daughter needed um, to have more friends, but when it came to meeting with the daughter, she was quite happy with the amount of social contact that she had, and she didn't see it as an issue. So, 
Uh, when the person is reluctant to participate, um, some of the referrals are not self-referrals, so they're made by someone in the ministry or, as I said before, a family or staff person. Um, and the person may not want to come to counseling. So dealing with that reluctance. And I always say, <laughs> it's kind of my soapbox, that uh, our service is completely voluntary because these folks are 19 years old and up. Um, it's totally their choice. So it's not meant to be something forced on them. In fact, you get very, don't get very far when it is something that they feel they're forced to do. Uh, it's not appropriate when it can be disruptive for a new person to enter the client support network. Uh, as Susan mentioned before, sometimes it may be more appropriate to work with their support team rather than the person themselves because they just can't deal with um, meeting a new person or even getting into their issues. They may not be there yet for that. Um, and when the needs are better met with another person or service. Um, some of the people think that coming to counseling is making a new friend and they, um, you know, I mean, we're not there to be the person's friend. We're there to help the person meet people perhaps, and, you know, increase their social skills. But um, we're not meant to be a filler in the person's schedule. Uh, if it's better to connect the person with um, a life skills worker or um, a buddy, something like that, that can get them connected in the community, then that's more appropriate than the person receiving counseling. Um, because there are some misconceptions among the clients that we're their, their friends. And you know, it's time to hang out with your buddy type of thing. Whoops, sorry about that. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. Uh, oh, there we go, sorry, thank you. <laughs> Um, and where, where there's the potential of re-traumatization. Um, some people who've been uh, abused um, may have held those memories in their mind for many, many years. And um, you know, when, when you come across somebody who's had a fair amount of trauma in their lives, people think that by taking care of them, they need to talk about it and deal with it. But in some cases, it can actually re-traumatize the person and make it worse. So in those cases, um, you know, counseling may not be appropriate at that point in their life. Maybe later, later on, but certainly not then. Oh, shoot, I did it again. And very often, um, it may. Um, oh, no, I'm doing it. I want to go back to the other slide. Oh, the back. Oh, we can go back there. Okay, yeah. Um, it may not be the, uh, the right time, um, but the time will come at a, another point um, that uh, a person um, needs more support and resources before they're able to um, uh, really uh, develop um, new skills or to uh, discuss issues that might really be of concern to them. They cannot do that unless they've got the support around them. And uh, we will uh, often keep connected with that person and when the timing is right, we would then um, proceed in um, helping that person learn coping skills and whatever issues need to be addressed. And th the um, potential of re-traumatization, I just wanted to speak a bit to it because we, we deal with that so often because um, there's a thought that if a person like Sheila had said, if that's in their background, well, then that needs to be resolved. And, and often it presents, a person will present um, 
with talking a lot about traumatic issues and their behavior will be uh, very much out of sorts and then people really really do want to uh, address this because they're talking about it all the time but often it is um, um, the person is speaking about trauma because they in fact are back in trauma again that that might be because they don't have enough support and resources so they are actually being triggered by their environment because they're not stable in their world so we would work to help build that stability often by making a bridge into other services um, um, and other resources Sheila, I did it again. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, specialized skills of the counselor uh, for us working in this field is that we really have an understanding of developmental disability. I should say that we are continually developing our understanding of developmental disability because it's a very difficult thing to grasp um, of what it means to live with a developmental disability of what a person's world is like to be able to step into that person's perspective and see the world through their eyes um, we come with a developmental perspective uh, that we believe that the person has the ability to learn and to change that their world is not static um, and, and we, we try to have realistic expectations to match um, what our expectations are to what their capacity is and to keep building on that. Uh, people have a wide range of ability and, li and limitations and, and um, in day-to-day in -day living, that is hard to understand um, because People can present as being very capable people, and um, they are struggling, and it takes a fair bit of um, interacting with them to find out what's going on in their life. Um, communication, which Dorothy has spent quite a bit of time trying to um, fill that in, because um, some people can be very good talkers and uh, have a wide vocabulary and it takes a fair bit to realize that, that they are having a, a very difficult time understanding what you say even if they're able to say back to you everything that you've said to them they don't have the comprehension behind it a wide range of cognitive and adaptive functioning, social and emotional development, behavioral and psychological functioning, the etiology of disability, of having an understanding of, of how that person ended up with a disability, of what of the many syndromes that there are um, and to have that understanding uh, can open up a door to to gain a bit more insight of what's going on in the world in that person's world um, uh, a good example of that for me was um, was learning about what prater willi syndrome was because my first encounter with someone with prater willi I didn't know anything about it. I had never heard that word before. And um, I was trying to uh, get this person into exercise and, and to, to be dieting. And, um, and I had no idea what that poor person was going through. Um, and um, Maybe I should explain what Prater Willi is for people here if they are not aware of that. Of uh, one component of that is is not having a sense of um, of being um, full 
of uh, ever feeling like you are satisfied from eating. You do not have that sensation in your body. And attention and short-term memory deficits. So we're always trying to figure out who a person is and to um, to tie in what we're doing to match how they are receiving information. Um, <clears throat> part of the skills of, of um, working with this population is, is knowing about other related issues that they might be going through. And um, one of those is being vulnerable to abuse and victimization. Um, a lot of the people that we've worked with have been abused in one way or another uh, or victimized in the past. Um, the, stigmat the stigmatized status in society, um, growing up with a disability uh, and, and all that that encompasses, uh, you know, the teasing, the bullying, um, and even as adults, uh, you know, getting into employment or making friends or, um, you know, doing what everybody else wants to do, um, sometimes they run across this. Yeah. What can happen too um, that we see with adults that there's not a connection with their um, peer group because they um, see their peer group as a really devalued group and they do not want to connect with people who are within their peer group, which is a, a, a big contribution to being very lonely and not having true deep friendships. And um, a lot of people come to us mainly because they want to get a boyfriend or girlfriend mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, think they're going to walk down the street and find the perfect woman or perfect man. That, that from being a concrete thinker, that's, uh, that's what a boyfriend or girlfriend is. But a boyfriend or girlfriend is someone who is deeply our peer, someone who is very similar to us. And people can often be cut off from that in their life because they so much are not wanting to identify with their peer group. And, um, which ties in with a lot of what we do is self-esteem and developing a self-knowledge and understanding of self. And I just wanted to say one thing about the, the vulnerability to abuse and victimization because this past week there was an article in Monday Magazine. I don't know if people here read that. Um, but it just highlights that um, this is, uh, the question was put forward in this article, like how much does this happen that we don't know about? It happens a lot that we don't know about. We know about it a little bit. And, and from the per perspective that Sheila and I come from, of, from working from the perspective of the person, that the way to help a person, to protect a person from abuse and victimization is that they do have their own voice and they do have a sense of knowing what is good in life and what's a, what is a healthy way to be treated. And because you can have all the protections in place in the environment and that does not stop this from happening because we know situations of people who, many, that um, people are starving for attention and touch and um, they, are, they are wanting to have that and they will put up with a lot of abuse uh, and not know that there is anything different than that. Or they might know, but this is what they've been used to most of their life. And um, in order not to be alone, they'll stay in that relationship and put up with that abuse. Um, poverty is a huge issue for this population and um, with that com can come inadequate housing and diet and sometimes just helping people um, 
<coughs> you know, uh, get a roof over their head or connecting them with somebody where they can do that and getting food, um, you know, it sort of takes precedence over the, the initial counseling issue. Um, Uh, and also with that comes a lack of resources and limited options. Um, when you don't have money, there's a lot of things you can't do that everybody else can do if they have the money. So um, a lot of them feel like they're stuck and um, they can't move forward or they try and move forward and they move, end up going three steps back. So this is like an ongoing issue for them. The culture the person was brought up in, um, <coughs> there's quite a variety of people that um, we see based on their age. I mean, you know, we can see people as young as 19, and I think one of my clients is as old as 65 or so. So someone who's that age has been brought up in most likely an institution. Um, uh, versus somebody who's 19 or 20, most likely in their family home. So that culture um, is a huge impact on the person. Um, people who've been brought up in their family home tend to have gone to regular schools and um, encountered teasing and bullying, uh, whereas somebody who was brought up in an institution may not have had any educational opportunities and that may not have been an issue for them. So uh, all these different experiences that people can have um, certainly impact who they are and the kind of problems that they come with. And then there's that whole um, integration population, um, the people that went through that, going from an institution into a group home or a family home. Um, you know, somebody who grew up in a family home wouldn't have had that background at all. So everybody comes with different backgrounds. Um, a lot of people have experienced failure, um, not just once or twice, but ongoing. And you know, being aware of that and understanding, you know, where that person might be coming from um, and how that will impact their motivation to change or do things differently or to learn. If they think they're a failure, quite often that's a block for them to, to move forward. A fair number of people that we work with also have a psychiatric diagnosis, um, uh, and it may have a atypical presentation. Um, it may go unnoticed because it seemed to be part of having a developmental disability. Um, it may present itself in many ways that we wouldn't um, normally think of a person Having depression, for example, um, may be um, a lot of challenging behavior. Um, we work um, quite closely with the developmental disability mental health support team, who are some people who are here today. We um, balance working with the client and the support network. Um, and it uh, is, an, is an ongoing balance. Um, to respect the person's confidentiality, while we also um, need to give information to the network and to receive information from the, the support network around a person. Um, we provide information and skills to the individual, but we also have to balance that with not putting them into conflict with their network. Um, so uh, we're always working with both. This, um, I think, comes up a, a fair bit dealing with sexuality issues um, because we all have um, strong beliefs around sexuality, sometimes whether we know that we do or not. And um, we have to be very sensitive in working with where the person is at and also working with the support network so that 
they are aware of what we are doing with the person, so they are supportive of that, while also um, respecting the person's um, story and what their, their private concerns are. And just to <clears throat> piggyback that comment, um, quite recently there was a referral for somebody who was exhibiting or what the um, caregivers had thought was sexual behavior. And um, after getting to know the client for a bit and his communication, uh, it, it turned out that this really wasn't the issue. The issue was that um, the person because of his communication difficulties, had a hard time expressing what he was trying to say, and it was being misinterpreted by the pe you know some of the people around him as being sexual behavior. Um, and when it was suggested that perhaps his um, communication could be expanded, uh, there was some resistance from his support network um, and consequently he's not coming now as a result of that. So sometimes even though the person may want the counseling, their support network may be an obstacle to continuing it, um, which is, can be a shame actually because then the person isn't getting the help that they need. Um, we combine different theoretical perspectives, for example, looking at where the person is developmentally, um, and based on that, uh, getting the person to be actively involved in, in the counseling process. Um, quite often we have assessments that um, come along with the person or beforehand we read them to sort of get a sense for where the person is intellectually, socially, uh, developmentally, cognitively, so that we can then tailor make, you know, their their therapy to their level of functioning. Um, uh, behavior. We also look at the behavior too, because um, as as we've heard <laughs> before that. Uh, behavior is a is communication, so we want to know what's behind that. Um, what are they trying to communicate with their behavior? Um, so we try and understand the function of their behavior and that their change, uh, any change can be influenced by um, external events. So um, if if there's something going on in the person's life that takes precedence over, um, you know, what the referral issue is, then obviously change in that issue might have to be put on hold. Bef and dealing with the other event, it might be more uh, important. Just thinking too, Sheila, that that is um, um, a situation. Th this too is a balance of the person involved in change or working at change from the external um, support around a person. And sometimes the balance is more towards the external um, and, and we are part of the um, community support team. Um, we sometimes work with Dorothy and sometimes we might um, uh, work with Mike Engel and the focus would be more on a behavioral uh, support plan. Um, and at times, too, we would then work to uh, include the person as much as possible in the development of that support plan and maybe to help interpret that what that behavioral support plan is all about to the individual. So adaptions. So we are always adapting um, traditional counseling approaches to fit in with the people that we work with. Um, and a significant one is translating abstract concepts into concrete use. Because on the whole, the people that we work with are concrete thinkers. And a lot of life is abstract. 
and um, that creates, creates a lot of uh, stress and anxiety in one's life to not always really know what's going on. Um, and it also makes it difficult uh, for them to participate in talking about their life when they are apart from what is going on in their life. So we, uh, we participate quite directly in events of our client's life, which is different than most traditional counseling approaches. Um, because by being a part of a person's life, we're, we're able to um, do things immediately within the moment. We're, we're able to uh, know what's going on in a person's life. We can see them interacting with people. Um, we can um, uh, know what's going on in someone's life, so we're able to then go into that in more depth. And we also, within that uh, immediate moment, we're able to directly problem solve on issues that are specifically important to that person at that moment in time and model ways to deal with life, um, modeling um, being calm, um, regulating our emotions, and um, giving a sense that uh, there is a different way of doing things. Uh, compensating for a limited understanding of time. Uh, a lot of people have difficulty with the concept of time. Um, so we are focused on the here and now and address problems as they occur. And um, in a practical basis, it's also um, uh, figuring out a way that we can actually meet with somebody if they have a hard time knowing um, the flow of time through a day. Um, we often pick people up uh, from where they live or work, um, or phone them the night before. Um. <coughs> and we uh, use a lot of um, hands-on kind of ways of learning things with uh, uh, videos, role plays, pictures, um, writing and art, something that is concretely there and um, also with being in the midst of a person's life we're able to pick up on some things that a person might say or some little interaction and we can we can build on that and help make a bridge over into some generalization into a, 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 a broader learning Um, <coughs> obviously, some t as, as we've heard from Dorothy, a lot of people have limited verbal skills, so um, helping them to expand, um, you know, it, the simple question of how are you feeling today um, might be quite difficult for somebody who doesn't have a large vocabulary or understanding of their feelings, so using language that's very simple and plain. Um, <coughs> Elaborating on the concrete description of experience, for example, um, I'm mad, and I think, Susan, you had a client who, um, you know, that was how she felt, yet she couldn't really elaborate on that concept of what mad meant for her, um, or maybe even what it was, what she was feeling mad about, so it's a lot of questions and, you know, trying to retrieve information um, from people whose vocabulary can be quite limited. Did you yeah, I just wanted, because that was my little example. Because it is, it is part of being a concrete thinker as well. Of That was her statement of who she was, so in the story, I'm a mad person. So it doesn't leave you much to work on if you're going to be uh, counseling a person, or providing anger management strategies to a person, well, uh, I'm just a mad person. I've always been a mad person, and uh, I probably always will be. 
so in really working with her for a, a little bit, it was amazing all what was going on inside of her, that she did not connect with the fact that she was a mad person. She had plenty to be mad about. But it was only by a fair bit of drawing things out um, was there anything there to work on. And then it was working beyond just her. It was uh, working with her doctor um, to uh, look at her um, need for some uh, support uh, for her anxiety, um, working with um, other people outside of her immediate uh, home to really address what was going on in her residence uh, where she lived. Um, she, um, the situation in her home was such that she shared her room, and um, if there was, uh, uh, there was people in where she slept and people lying on the couch in the living room, well, she actually had no place to be. She had no private space. Um, she would sometimes sit at the kitchen table. Um, and she also, it took a long time to get that information to come out because she was fiercely loyal to where she lived and she did not want to have any critical eyes on her place where she lived, and she didn't want anybody to disrupt that. So there was a need to be really sensitive to, for her to even feel it was okay to share that. Communication. Um, some of the people that we work with are nonverbal, um, so, uh, working with Dorothy uh, to, de to find out what their communication system is, um, doing sign language, uh, using pictures, yes, no, cue cards, gestures, body language, anything that uh, will help us figure out what the person is, is saying. Yeah. systems with the client, or does somebody accompany them to the session? Does that work? Both. Um, usually, uh, I check in with Dorothy to see what their communication system is, um, and, uh, and their staff, uh, or whoever they're living with. And then, um, if I don't know how to use it, then I will ask Dorothy or the staff person to come with me. Uh, or attend the first couple of sessions until I can become comfortable. Um, or if the person is hearing impaired, sometimes um, an interpreter will come because I do know sign language, but if the person is quick, I'm not good at reading it. I can do it better than I can read it. Um, and there have been several clients who um, I have asked the staff person to attend because I have a really bad ear, and when it comes to understanding the person's speech, um, I have a fair bit of difficulty with that until, um, so if somebody familiar comes with them and repeats back what they're saying, and then I get in tune with what their speech is. So um, yeah, we've done that also. And sometimes um, we also work quite closely with Dorothy, uh, that Dorothy would be the communication support for the person and that I would provide the counseling support for the person. So um, then neither one of us have our attention divided to be working with the person. So checking for comprehension. Um, is an ongoing process through all of this um, for many reasons. Um, the, the, um, the level of cognitive ability, the, um, the uh, ability to um, uh, get information from, from um, the outside world, um, and the person may be very motivated to uh, not want anybody to notice that they don't know um, that they don't want their disability to be recognized, and that uh, people can be very highly skilled at appearing to understand what's going on. 
Um, and uh, having all the body language and the repeating back, um, and really it can kind of come as a bit of a shock sometimes <laughs> to realize that that person doesn't, doesn't get it, um, because it sure looks like they do. Um, and there is also a, a, through a person's life history of um, not knowing that they have a voice and that they can say something different. They can not understand what I'm saying and it's okay to tell me what they want to do. Um, and actually that just happened to me yesterday with somebody. <laughs> that all the years that I've been seeing her, she said yesterday, yesterday to me that she would really like it. No, actually it was Friday. She would really like it if I came at a certain day and a certain time because she could not keep track of having an appointment on a different time, which was fabulous for her to be able to say that to me. And that's so ongoing consultation and involvement with support network is crucial, absolutely crucial to our work. And I was thinking about that with um, when you were speaking about communication because particularly people who are AAC users, it is such an expenditure of energy to put thoughts into, um, from to, to make the shift from being inside of your head to the outside world, that to get the context of what's going on in a person's life, very often I, I need that input from the support network because there is no way, and it's completely unfair, I think, to expect a person using an augmentative system to fill me in on all the details of what's going on with something, that someone else can do that and then they can talk about what's going on inside of them and their emotional response and what's happening to them because of that. And if I don't have the information about the person's life, then what they're saying to me, it doesn't make any sense to me. It takes me way too long to figure out what's going on for that person. And um, it's important to clarify the pur purpose of counseling uh, to the individual, which Sheila has already uh, spoken to, that uh, a lot of people don't have many friends, and um, they don't have many friends that are such great listeners, and that work so hard to have them have a voice, and that is a skill that we have. Um, and it, it's, it's um, it, for some people, it, it's a bit of a new experience to be in a relationship with somebody that really sees them as a person that is a contributing, competent person with a perspective on life that's uniquely their own, and that I am learning from them. So they uh, sometimes really want to spend time with us. And it's, um, it's a difficult balance. And um, sometimes um, we, we all have people that, of course, we do stay connected with over 12, 15 years. <laughs> we, be, we do become a part of people's lives, but uh, we can't with everybody, and we try our best to, to acknowledge that and, and work towards that person making connections in their natural support. And also important to be aware of the impact of ending the counseling process. for that reason, because uh, we can become an important part of someone's life. And uh, it's a very uh, um, individual way that we withdraw from each person, because you, you don't want it to be seen as a person needing to have a problem in order to spend time with us. So it's building up a person's skills 
connecting with other people that they have that kind of rapport and relationship with. And also that we, we are available to people uh, after we, are, we have a referral. Um, they can phone us up and reconnect with us if there is a need to do that. And that happens all the time. Uh, people that we might not have seen for five, eight years or something will phone up themselves and say that they want to talk about something or somebody in their network will do that. Uh, these are some of the issues that we address in counseling. Um, <coughs> providing people with skills uh, to describe their thoughts and feelings because as we mentioned earlier, sometimes people will just say a couple of words and that's kind of it. And so we need to draw more information out and um, give them ways to describe what's going on for them. Um, establishing stability, uh, whether that's internal uh, within themselves or external um, in conjunction with their support <coughs> network. Um, so as, as we mentioned earlier, sometimes it's, you know, people just need the simple thing of having food and housing so to make them more stable in order to proceed with other issues. So, you know, establishing stability in w whatever way that means so the person feels safe. Um, acceptance of self. This is a big one. Um, as we said before, a lot of these folks don't want to admit that they have a disability or hang out with other folks with disabilities. So um, getting them to come to terms with who they are um, and um, embracing their strengths and limitations. You know, we all have things we need to work on. Um, and at some point, hopefully accepting their disability um, I guess we all have things that about ourselves that are hard to accept, but um, it's it's better to you know take a look at them and try and work with them rather than keep bucking them because that causes more stress sometimes than actually coming to terms with it. But that can be a huge one for for these folks. And emotional regulation is um, kind of the uh, bones of what we do with most people. Uh, what I do with myself as well, of um, being able to learn the skills to regulate emotions is a skill the whole world needs more of. Um, to be able to identify our feelings, understand the range of feelings, um, starting off with kind of four basic feeling groups, um, happy, sad, uh, angry, scared. Um, some people don't have an understanding of the different groupings of feelings, putting names onto it, understanding that internal body state, understanding how to recognize that in other people. Um, Self-calming skills, uh, learning, um, the mind, body, uh, way of, uh, of uh, being able to enter into that loop of, of emotions and thoughts to either um, uh, to be learning uh, relaxation skills, ways to ground oneself, um, uh, learning about um, uh, of the self-talk that we have, of how that impacts how we feel, and how both of those go back and forth. And uh, it is quite uh, wonderful to see that when how life changes for people who learn these skills. These are skills that we can all learn. Uh, it just really helps to have them identified to know that there are skills that there that it is information to actually learn about, and we can apply it to ourselves and to be working, again, that balance with the individual and the support network of um, having the support network being able to cue the person, to have the person being 
having regular practice to be learning how to use um, relaxation skills. Uh, relationships. Um, all the relationships that are in our lives. Um, friendships, family, sweethearts, marriage prep, parenting skills. These are a part of everybody's lives. And to understand the dynamics within that, how you make friends, uh, how you keep friends, how somebody becomes our sweetheart, who is uh, someone who is a potential sweetheart in our life, what is family. Some people have really strong family, some people have no family. But I come from the perspective in speaking with people that as adults, we create our own family who in your life is, are the people who are your kin and your family, who can you really count on, and, and building up on that. Um, and every so often, we have the honor of being a part of marriage preparation with people, which is always fabulous when that happens. That is one of the key, um, the key parts of having a good and happy life, is to have a companion in life. And it takes a lot of work to have a companion in life. Um, and there are skills to learn to do that. And um, we also are involved with uh, parenting skills. And Sheila, I'll let you speak to that, because that's sweet. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, yeah, a lot of the people I work with uh, are parents themselves. And um, like any parent, there are issues. Um, and uh, quite a few of them are single parents also. So they have no one to bounce these things off of other than their child. So um, quite often, I do deal with parenting issues. And sometimes also, separation and divorce to go along with, like, like everybody else, you know, quite a, quite a bit of that happens in this population also. and. Um, helping them through that. Oh. Oh, sorry. Sexuality, uh, which we have talked about before. Um, what it is to have an intimate relationship with somebody, um, how to have healthy sex, um, you know, safe sex. Uh, especially this day and age. Um, knowing what an abusive relationship is um, and what assault is, sexual assault or rape. Um. Mm -hmm. Along the lines of assault and, and abuse, um, is there also the recognition that some of that may be um, the need of the individual to have attention Yes. In fact, um, quite recently, I am working with a client on that very issue where um, she's had a fair bit of assault in her life and abuse and um, has made some false accusations um, and recently came forward and um, presented some information. Um, and of course, the first thing to, to weed out was whether or not it was true or not. And it turns out that it, it is true. Um, but certainly, we are aware of that. Um, there have been cases I think we've both worked with that um, people have done that for attention. Or um, they've lived their life in crisis. You know, that's been their life. And they can't seem to, even though we, you know, we do teach about healthy choices and um, you know, how to have a good life. It's not what they're familiar with. Um, and quite often, the crises tends to draw them back. And how do you develop a crisis? You develop a story. Um, so that, that, is, uh, that can happen. And yeah, we, 
we are aware and it's, it can be very difficult to suss out whether it's actually true or not. Yeah. And an, another aspect sometimes is that people's experience with sex uh, has always been very negative and uh, assaultive. Um, and they don't know anything about uh, healthy sexuality. They've never experienced that. And sometimes are they very ashamed of sexuality? And uh, they may have been involved with, in a consensual, mutual relationship uh, with a peer. And after it was over, they said, oh my gosh, you know, this is wrong. I, I'm not supposed to do this. And, um, and then uh, speak about that experience in very negative terms when it was actually happening, it was consensual. Um, so sometimes pregnancy happens and um, even talking to the person about what their choices are, um, whether to keep the child or um, put it up for adoption or abortion. Um, I have several clients who've had children that were removed and um, they either, some of them don't have any contact with those children and some of them do. And it can be difficult for both uh, to get yearly updates or see them once or twice a year can be hard on them. But then again, for those that don't see their kids, that can be hard too. So that, uh, that comes up as an issue. Mm. I'm just looking at the time here. I'll have to start speeding up a bit. <laughs> so advocacy, uh, really an important skill that people uh, learn that they have a voice and how to access the um, broader community to let people know what's going on with them. Um, I just recently w was involved with somebody who was um, telling me that he had, um, he's on WCB because he had um, uh, injury on the job and then found out that his um, uh, work earnings, uh, the $500 you're able to earn on top of your PWD benefits, uh, was going to be deducted dollar for dollar because WCB, d WCB benefits are not considered part of that exemption. So that's something that he should take to his MLA. People need to know about these things, and the MLAs are glad to learn about these things. They, they don't know this, and they appreciate knowing what's going on, just as an example. So we're always on many levels wanting people to have their own voice and knowing that their issues are of concern to the broader community. Uh, depression and anxiety. Um, a, a, Life is hard uh, for all of us, and it's hard when you have all of these barriers to figuring out what is going on, um, which there are high levels of depression and anxiety in this community. Grief and loss, um, helping people identify their feelings, and also working with the broader network to make sure that a person is involved in the grief and loss that's going on in their network. So if there is uh, someone important to them that is ill, uh, is dying, or has died, that they are part of that process, that they visit that person, they, they get to have that connection, they go to the funeral. Addictions, um, as, as people are uh, in the community, they are in all aspects of the community. Um, so um, uh, we have people that are struggle with addictions to um, uh, many different substances that are available. And because it's difficult, it's still very difficult for people to access generic services for support because of, of um, not having um, the understanding of all what's going on in a person's life. We get involved in providing counseling support for people around these issues and also bridge to the generic services and work uh, with the generic services like the drug and alcohol counselors. Um, safety skills in the community. Self-esteem, uh, very, uh, 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 always a part of what we're doing. Assertiveness and developing support networks. <laughs>